Although Ruth Lyons was unhappy over the treatment NBC had given to her show, it didn't harm her popularity. Instead, WLWT was overwhelmed by the request for tickets to her show. The size of her studio audience was doubled to 100, turning the 50 Club into the 50-50 Club. The reason it went to 50-50 was because the one year she put tickets out, they got seven years worth of a request. So we split it to three and a half and made it go 50-50. In the weeks leading to the breakup with NBC, Ruth encouraged the WLWT sales staff to replace her national sponsors with local and regional advertisers. The show's commercials were really filling up and they wanted more pizzazz in the commercials. So John Murphy brought in a guy from the craft show in NBC New York, or he was from. Bill Hurley was his name. He didn't know how to direct. He never worked control room. He was a true producer. So it went along okay for a couple of weeks until he and Ruth had a bit of a falling out in her office one morning. We were having a big chorus of Air Force cadets to come in and sing Christmas carols. That takes some preparation, you know, where they're gonna stand, what kind of mics they're gonna use and all this, lighting. Well, Hurley hadn't done anything about it. They were just gonna walk in and sing. So I was talking to Ruth about what does she wanna do with this? And we're walking into her office and she opens the door and there's Bill Hurley sitting behind her desk in her chair with his feet on her desk reading the racing form. Right, she gave me this look. I mean, she had a look that'll knock you down. And she just told him to get out. <laughs> and uh, she didn't mind me in just the office. The very next day, George Reising would assume the reins as Ruth's producer and director. The 50-50 Club, starring Ruth Lyons. The next line, stand by on two, dissolve to two. It's fun to get together, fun to get together, fun to get together every day at 12 o'clock. No Despite his youth, Ruth gave George considerable freedom to revamp an already successful show. You know, being young and crazy, and I thought I knew it all, of course. I immediately started making changes. For instance, visitors from Hollywood often seemed ill at ease in the primitive, sometimes cheesy surroundings of local TV. The set was kind of a laughing stock of the world. I got rid of that big box that she sat behind. I mean, it was ugly as could be. So I started with more of a homey set, upholstered rockers, a big window background, drapes and foliage and things like that to make it more intimate. Eventually, Ruth and Reising would take a microphone and transform it into something iconic. Her microphone was in a bouquet of flowers. In other words, you talked into the bouquet. She hated the microphone with the black cords. So I got her you know, a white mic and I got a florist to supply flowers every day to put on that mic. Well, this is kind of a trademark, you know. I never stay in one place too long on a show. And I had to carry this horrible looking mic. Get so tired of looking at that stick all the time. And many years ago, I decorated it. I thought maybe that'll work for me. I decided against it. However, one of the biggest changes to the 50-50 Club didn't come from its star or producer. Willie Thal was so identified with Ruth Lyons that his image appeared alongside hers on calendars, glassware, even dish towels. Willie's function was to be the male that she could uh, make fun of, could tease and, you know, about a lot of things, and he played it very well. I never heard such tones come out. Air shape. You were a little Bell off tone. again. Mm. Could you get your last note just a little up? Kind of for the famous, for the famous the 50 Club is on the air. What note you got? It's Willie. I don't know, Gene. He, he just, he, it's something in your yeah. voice that shouldn't be yeah. there. Gravel? I don't know what it is, whether it's gravel or what it is. 
She needed, you know, a scapegoat, and he was it. But he didn't like that role. After eight years of standing in Ruth Lyon's shadow, Willie Thaw sought a greater share of the spotlight. In January 1957, he left the 5050 Club to launch his own program. Well, Ruth, when she heard the news, was absolutely, she called me up in tears. Mm. And I said, he's got to be out of his mind. Well, she said, he's going, and she said, I'm going to miss him so much. She was just, she was mad and she was heartbroken. So he goes to WKRC and tries to do his own show. Didn't go. Because he, see, he didn't have Miss Lyons, the rapport between them, you know? And uh, he needed that. He asked me to come over with him, and I told Ruth, and she got so mad. She picked up the phone and told me to get out of the office. I don't know who she called. <laughs> but she was really mad that he would ask me that. I wouldn't even consider it, because I knew the show wasn't going to last. Determined that she would never again be so closely tied to a single sidekick, Ruth filled the gap with a trio of rotating co-hosts. Ruth called us the Three Musketeers. There was a boy named Sid Doherty, Peter Grant, and I was the third member. And then Ruth thought that three were too many. And so one day, Sid went into the office and said, Ms. Lyons, I don't think I'm contributing as much to it as I should to the program. She said, well, then I'll be fine. We won't need you anymore. So he, he's probably sorry he ever went in there. The survivors would become two of the 5050 Club's strongest assets, staying at Ruth's side to the very end. Bob Braun came to the show as an aspiring vocalist, but displayed even greater flair when it came to delivering live, ad-libbed commercials in the Ruth Lyons tradition. Deliciously ice cold in that king-size bottle, ready to reach in the refrigerator, latch onto, and uncap a king-size bottle to give you that refreshing new feeling. That Bob Braun was a another Arthur Godfrey type salesman. I mean, he, he made it sound like it was just part of the program. You know, he didn't shift gears and say, oh, you got to go to bed, you know, none of that. But there was a difference between Bob Braun and Ruth Lyons in that Bob was more of a performer. He was on, uh, I don't mean phony, he was very real, but Bob had a real sparkle like a performer. Ruth Lyons didn't really try to do that. She was more, she was just real and, and down to earth. Ruth's decision to pull veteran newsman Peter Grant into the 50-50 club cast created some uneasiness in the Crosley executive suite. The management of the station did not like Grant doing 50 Club. They said it lessens his credibility. I always felt that he picked up a lot of viewers by being with Ruth, that had never seen him or didn't watch the news. Famous, you know, newscaster, and Miss Lyons brought him in there, you know, he so stayed and uh, really made him, everybody just loved Peter Grant after they knew who he really was. He brought the real Peter Grant out. He was very quick with it had a good sense of humor. He and Ruth did get along. She got a, a real kick out of his uh, old-fashioned courteousness and the gentleman and the way he dressed and everything. And he was very smart. And she could have a lot of fun with him. Hey, they're pretty, aren't they? They sure are. I noticed that, though. Any young married ones? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lucy? Yeah. Lucy? Yeah. Stand up, Lucy. Uh, my I'm mic isn't long enough, enough. I'm sorry. My cord, my cord's too Please short. Come over here. I, I... Put the microphone down. The cord's not too short. Come over here. Hey, Clifford, come here. Where are you going? Um, Lucy, what is your last name? Uh, Lucy, this is Mr. Lash. How do you do, Lucy? How are you? Keep hey, going. Pretty, isn't she? Where's Peter? Lucy, are you going steady? No. Oh, good. There's an opportunity. Ever been engaged? No. Under 29? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Never ask a woman there at her age. Well, that's that's no. all right. I think that's all right in my case. Lucy, you'll wait after want... the show in the... We have a room where I have the boys meet the girls again, get better acquainted. You'll wait, will you? Sure. 
Sure. All right. Well, the reason I always ask, I couldn't have a child ride. And Lucy looks so young, you can't tell. She struck out playing matchmaker for Peter and Cliff, but Ruth hit a home run by bringing two young performers together. Steve Lawrence was on the show. He was dating Edith Gournay. I mean, they were very much in love, but he was, you know, on his gigs here, she was on her gigs here, and they never saw each other enough. So he was talking to Ruth about it, and, and Ruth says, well, do you love her? And he said, absolutely. He, she said, well, then ask her to marry you, and you do, you go, you do gigs together. He picks up the phone. He called Edie Gourmet from Ruth Lyon's office and asked her to marry him. And she said yes. And they started doing their gigs together, no more separate. Ruth's willingness to offer advice and counsel to everyone from stars to setup boys earned her the nickname of Mother. It was a term of endearment that stuck. She was like a mother hen. I mean, she, everybody came to her. Uh, and to tell them, you know, their problems or, you know, what, you know, what, ask her advice, what to do with this, with that, and the other. You always were welcome to come into her office and sit down on her couch and, and talk, you know. She's just a great lady. Mother often served as an unofficial court of last resort in resolving professional crises. When negotiations between WLWT and the Musicians Union collapsed, Ruth paid an 11th hour visit to the man who'd hired her back in 1942, Crosley Broadcasting President Robert Dunville. Ruth walked into Bob's office and said, well, I guess if they have a strike, you'll see me on the picket line. And he said, what? He said, I'm a member of the Musicians Union. I march with the musicians. I picket with them. The strike was settled, there was no strike, the musicians got their contract, all went well. Ruth Lyons' behind-the-scenes clout stemmed from her on-camera power as a peerless salesperson, making her Crosley's single most valuable property. Remaining true to the style she forged during her early days in radio, she would ad-lib her way through 18, 19, even 20 commercials per show. No tape, no film, no scripts. And when it came to products that she advertised, none got on her program unless she honestly could recommend it to her audience. There's always somebody wanting you to advertise this or that and the other. I can't talk about something I don't believe in. There's no point in it. Companies were stunned to learn of Ruth's insistence on personally trying and approving every item she sold. Once she accepted a product for her show, clients usually waited two years for a coveted advertising slot to open up on the 50-50 Club. We had what we called an abeyance list. We had as many, uh, if not more, advertisers on the abeyance list waiting to get on than we had advertisers. Being in sales for so many years, it was always a uh, kind of an annuity. If you got a, a sponsor onto Ruth's program, you were kind of set for life. Your commission was set for a long time because once they got on, they never really uh, got off. And when she would hold up that product and say, you know, this hand cream is what I use, and of course my whole family uses it, and it would fly off the shelves. Viewers responded not only to Ruth's belief in her products, but also to her personal credibility. She was so dead on honest. She was for real, and everybody knew it. When Ruth said, don't buy this refrigerator, she would say that because it doesn't make the ice right and it doesn't do this and the doors don't close and it keeps going beep, beep all the time. And, and she said, don't buy, they would go out of business. Ruth's commitment to her clients extended far beyond holding up boxes and bottles during a 90-minute show. If she didn't like the way a product was being presented by the company's advertising agency, Ruth didn't hesitate to take charge of the situation. The producer at that time came to me and said, well, sir, the mattress wants this, this picture, this montage picture uh, displayed in the studio. And uh, as I recall, I think I said, uh, I don't think it's going to play too well. It's, uh, it's, it's not a very flattering picture of the person. I'm the producer, and we're going to put this on. So put it out there. And then uh, I think it was one of the first things Ruth saw that day on the show. Walked out, uh, 
uh, in her entrance. She keeps coming back. Called me out. Said, uh, I told you Friday that that's to go out. And come here to bring that over here once more for the last time. I will not have that on this show. It looks too much like me, and I won't have it. Look at that. Do you, do you consider, I call this negative advertising. You know? I mean, the very thought of putting a face like that with the name Serta upsets my soul. Or with life. It looks like death. <laughs> Formed over. Yes. Bill? Now, I want to talk to you like a mother. Come here. How many times have I asked you to get this woman out of here and keep her out? We sold Serta mattresses for 900 years, and we don't need this horrible negative approach that you have to look like this before you buy a mat. Well, they'd scare the salesman to death if you came in. What, would you raise your right hand now? Will you say, uh, repeat after me. I promise. I promise. To get this woman out of here. To get this woman out of here. And keep her out. Keep her out. So help me. So help me. Okay. What, what are the agency men going to say? The agency men. Out! Out! <laughs> so he's working for the agency men now. That'll be the day. The crew-wise, she had to know everybody that was on the crew. Now, occasionally, we had changes. Ruth was very well aware of uh, any and all people in and around the show uh, that were connected with the uh, station. And every and time she saw a new face, uh, such as a new setup man or setup boy, as we called him in those days, you rest assured she was going to pull him out there and give him a quick uh, interview. And I think they always ended with, just remember, I'm running this show. Don't forget it. And as a long-established chain of supermarkets learned, advertisers who didn't like her methods could leave the show at their own peril. Albers had been her sponsor from oh, yes. almost yes. since the beginning. Yes. Uh, Kroger's was waiting in the wings. They were dying to get on. But of course, she couldn't have two supermarkets. And Albers was her pet. Well, Albers was sold to a firm in Atlanta. And they said, who is Ruth Lyons? Whoops. So they send up Big mistake. a young man who is the advertising, one of the advertising executives. And he watches the show once or twice. And he goes home and says, no good at all. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> well. <laughs> Albers was dropped. Kroger came in like that. Within less than a year, Albers was out of business. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the, the ladies quit going to Albers and they went to Kroger's. Ruth Lyons saw no reason to back down from a challenge, even when it came from America's largest consumer products company. What happened was is that Ruth's show was on from noon to 1.30. And, uh, Procter & Gamble at the time on the network, on the NBC network, had soap operas running. And of course, P&G being based in Cincinnati, they had a lot of people ask why wasn't their program seen in their own home market? And it was because of Ruth Lyons. So they tried a number of times, that is P&G, came to the station management asking them, almost pleading with them, to move Ruth to another time. She refused to do it. She said, noon to 1.30 is where my ladies are able to watch me, and this is where I want to stay. Infuriated by her stubbornness, Procter & Gamble vowed not to spend another cent on the 50-50 club. Ruth found out about it. She said, that's fine. She says, go out and get me another sponsor. So the sales department in New York went to Philadelphia, have, uh, got in touch with, a, uh, with an outfit called Fells Naphtha. Well, now let's see. We'll give somebody the instant fells. We've talked about that for 12 years. If you don't know about that now, you never will. You know that this is the one soap product still left on the American market to put in any kind of a washer to assure you fresh uh, smelling, fresh, clean, lovely clothes that never harm your skin or the most delicate baby skin. That's the instant fells. Give that to somebody. Fells Naphtha became number one in Cincinnati in a little less than six months. They went from an unknown product in Cincinnati to being number one, and it just drove P&G crazy. So um, th that's what happened. This shows you the power, the influence that Ruth had over the, uh, the audience that she had in Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus, and Indianapolis. Her influence even extended to baseball, 
when a relentless push to fill the All-Star team with players from the Cincinnati Reds forced the National League commissioner to take action. Ruth Lyon said, everybody send in your votes. You know, let's get every spot on that team a Cincinnati Red. Well, darned if they didn't do it. And they changed the rules after that year. The power of the woman. She had better luck a few years later, boosting her beloved Reds into the World Series by writing an anthem. In spite of her importance as the financial locomotive pulling the entire Crosley Broadcasting Group, there were still glass ceilings even Ruth Lyons couldn't crack. She always felt that she was shortchanged because they wouldn't name her a vice president. That was a, a big bone of contention in her mind. And uh, she wasn't on the board of directors and things like that. She should have been. Ruth may not have held a corporate title, but there was never any doubt who held the upper hand. When I came down here, uh, young, trembling, awestruck about Miss Lyons. Uh, as general manager of WLWT, I was called into John Murphy's office and he said to me, Ruth Lyons has ordered a new grand piano. Walter Bartlett was sent up to her office by John Murphy to tell her specifically that we couldn't afford a new piano because business wasn't as good as it should be. So I go up and, and she has me come in and she had rocking chairs in her uh, uh, offices up there and then we sat down, we had some tea, she asked me about my family and where we settled and then she was just magnificent. Mm -hmm. And she said, now why are you here? And I said, well, Miss Lyons, uh, you have ordered a new piano and I can't afford it in your budget this year. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to delay it till next year if that's all right. And she said, that's perfectly all right, Walter. That's not a problem in the world. So I, I get up oh, with a big man. smile, shake hands, went back downstairs and, and said to John Murphy, hey, it's, that, th this was fine. This was, she was wonderful. He left. She picked up the phone, called Bob and said, could you have that here by tomorrow? The piano was delivered and no one ever said a word. <laughs> <laughs> she was a big girl. Ruth's occasional frustrations with WLWT's management were tempered by her gratitude for the company's unstinting support of the cause closest to her heart. It all began in 1939 when Ruth assembled a group of entertainers to visit patients at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. When she discovered that each child might receive nothing more than an orange or perhaps a few pieces of candy for Christmas, Ruth took the problem straight to her listeners. Do you recall how much it came in the first year? The first year was a thousand dollars and that was at WKRC. We thought that was the most money in the wide world. It was an unassuming birth for one of America's most durable charities, the Ruth Lyons Children's Fund. And one of the conditions I made when I came to this uh, station was, could I have time or could I collect this Christmas fund? But they have been very generous and not a cent has ever been taken out for any expense whatsoever. And I don't think there's a fund in the country that can say that. Launching every year on her October 4th birthday, the Ruth Lyons Children's Fund campaign was a ubiquitous holiday season presence across much of the Midwest. Performers from the 5050 Club would travel throughout the area to entertain hospitalized youngsters, just as Ruth had done in 1939. Because we went to every city covered by the show. We had nearly 100 hospitals, and we went to at least 50 of them every year, so that every two years we would have been to all of them. As Ruth's TV popularity hit new heights, donations from her viewers also soared. Before long, the Ruth Lyons Children's Fund was able to provide hospitals with everything from TV sets and air conditioning to playrooms stocked with carefully chosen toys. For Ruth, the fund was deeply personal and was guided by her deepest principles. She wouldn't allow you to have a dance and publicize the dance that proceeds go to Ruth Lyons show. Her feeling was that if you take that away from the people, they'll no longer feel that it's theirs. It'll be big business making a buck off of it, so to speak, by attracting customers. She didn't like the fund used for that method. 
In spite of her demanding schedule, Ruth found time to maintain hands-on control over her children's fund, overseeing the annual distribution of hundreds of thousands of dollars to regional hospitals. All in all, it is just mushroomed, you know, from a very small endeavor to uh, something that we just can't afford not to do. By 1957, Ruth Lyons was no longer merely a talk show host, a brilliant saleswoman, or even a pioneer of early TV. She had become a nationally recognized philanthropist, the creator of the largest privately operated charity in America. And now, nearly two decades after its modest start, the Ruth Lyons Children's Fund would help guide its founder to some of the most surprising triumphs of her career.